Hey, can everybody hear me? Is my audio working? Hello, Tevit. How are you? Hello, hello, Shahir uh, Mirze. How are you? Do we have any questions I can answer? Happy New Year, Robert. Happy New Year. <clears throat> my uh, my guest star today is um, a rosé prosecco mixed with uh, gray whale gin. Paul, welcome. Do we have any questions? Happy New Year. We're also working with uh, a little coffee because the night is young. <clears throat> wow, we're already at 13 people. That's very, very cool. 13 people and no questions. How am I going to do my, uh, <coughs> I'm going to do my duty here if I don't have any questions to answer. We're still early though. We still have two minutes till we even start. So no worries. <clears throat> YouTube gets really like oddly excited when I go live. GJG, I'm sorry. I actually don't do anything with property insurance. I do only employment law. I like if my family, um, if my family has like issues with the law, I hire attorneys in like whatever field they're dealing with. I, I, I don't know anything but employment law. I'm sorry, GJ. Um, Danielle Lara says, what is a resolution between a lawyer and the company and what is the process? Danielle, I think you're talking about a settlement. I'm not entirely sure what you mean by what is a resolution. Like if you reach a deal through counsel or, or on your own with your employer in a lawsuit against your employer, then that would be a settlement and that would be a resolution. Hi, Mikey. Uh, Betty Lynn asks, hi, Vincent. Can I publicly tell the team when I am put on a performance improvement plan? You can, unless, um, unless you are, have agreed not to. Like, there's no legal reason that I'm aware of in any jurisdiction why you couldn't share that unless you have signed some contract saying you won't. Um, but break that question up into two parts. One, can you? The answer in most jurisdictions is going to be yes, unless you contractually agreed not to. Two, should you? Should you? Well, that's probably generally maybe probably not. Um, it's not like your coworkers are going to like rush to your aid and help you necessarily. So I wouldn't recommend it. Shahir, I, I Ronaldo or Messi? I I don't know. Uh, my entire exposure to football uh, is um, that TV show with uh, Ryan Reynolds and the guy from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Sorry. Um, Robert Stelhersky says, I have two questions, but the first is if the retaliation portion of your case is beyond federal, is beyond the federal statute of limitations. But within the state statute of limitations, would you sue the whole case in state court? Robert, depends. Uh, depends. If you can find a claim that would legitimately keep you in federal court and you like the procedures, the, the, the jury pool or the procedure or whatever it is, we just did a video on choosing state court versus federal court. If you did that process of making that decision... <coughs> and you heavily came down on the idea that you want to be in federal court for whatever reason, then I would probably search around and try to find a federal claim that you can legitimately bring, like a sincere claim that could win. Uh, you can't just do it like a fake junk claim. It's not going to work out for you. But if you have a sincere claim, like a real good faith claim that you can use for a federal question, a federal you know, actual claim, then use that to stay in federal court and just bring your state claims in federal court. 
if you don't have a reason why you'd prefer to be in federal court, then yeah, sure. State court's great if it meets your needs. Mikey, I am well. Thank you. How are you? Melanie D says, hi, what happened when a lawyer oversteps outside of the U.S.? I am suing for wrongful termination, but the company said an American lawyer is not allowed to practice in my country. Um, well, you're, are you suing for employment issues that arose outside the U.S. or inside the U.S.? Like, I've sued lots of companies that are based outside the U.S., but I was representing an employee who was working within the U.S. So the idea that you're not like I've sued companies in Singapore, China, France, I mean, all, all over the world. If they have assets and employees in the U.S., you can sue them in the U.S. That's not over. Excuse me. That's not necessarily overstepping. Um. Oh, you're planning on flagging him to the state bar? I, yeah, I don't know. If if you didn't have any connection to the U.S. <clears throat> with your employment, then that would have potentially been inappropriate. But generally speaking, if there was any tie to the U.S., that would be appropriate. Um, Betty Lynn, yeah, if you agree to some kind of confidentiality, then you may be bound by that clause. Um, it's it's going to be about whatever you agreed to whatever contractual clause you've agreed to. Also, though, I mean, if your employer has rules saying, hey, you don't talk about your performance improvement plans and you break those rules, you could potentially be terminated for that. DK says, my former employer, which involved the recent merger of two larger medical practices, is using the same actor defense regarding my claim. I was not hired and fired by the same manager. DK, I don't, oh, DK goes on. In fact, my boss who hired me did not even know that I had been let go until after I had been terminated by the manager of the other merged practice. So does the same actor defense stand? I don't really, I don't really understand how that'd be a defense. You're not alleging that the person who hired you discriminated against you. You're discriminating, you're, you're alleging that the person who did the bad thing to you, terminated you, was discriminated against you, I assume, right? So it's not the same person. So why would it, why would they say it's the same actor? That, that doesn't even make sense or apply. Um, yeah, that doesn't even make sense. I don't know what they're trying to say there. Um, I would, if I was you, have your attorney figure out what the lay of the land is after the merger and who has liability and sue everybody and let the courts figure it out. Melanie, your employer sent an American lawyer? I don't I don't fully understand. I don't understand. Was the employment in, in the US? Like what um what was I, I guess there's probably a more in-depth situation that you could share with us, but maybe it maybe it's tough for a live because the questions go by quick. So if you want <coughs> to post a more in-depth version of your question, post in the comment section, one of the videos, and I'll get to it. I'll try to make you a video kind of breaking down if that, what that attorney did was appropriate or not. Certainly. Uh, Robert Stalhersky has says, I have a last question. If your client worked for a federal contractor, would the EEOC pass on the affirmative action part of the OFCCP in a disability discrimination case? Robert, I'm gonna I'm gonna say one caveat here. Off the top of my head, I'm not sure. Second part of the answer is I would expect it would, but I don't want to tell you yes because I don't know for a fact. Um, so I think so, but I can't be positive. Galaxy Climber, I have seen EOC investigations take. <clears throat> as little as 48 hours and as long as four and a half years. The longest ever was four and a half years. That is very rare, but I've seen that. See you later, Shahir. Take care. Um, Ray Bethel says, how common are fair chance law Oh, how, how common is the Fair Chance Act used? 
especially when the background company reports an error when the employer uses that information to fire you after you were hired and also breaks the uh, FCRA rule. Uh, so I see a lot of Fair Chance Act litigation, um, but I hear from a lot of potential clients that other firms aren't taking them. So uh, I know that we take them. Like I know, I know we accept those claims, uh, but I don't, I can't say in general how common they are. Sean H. Uh, asks us, do you believe that discrimination exists when companies use various ATS applicant tracking systems for hiring? An example would be Workday, NeoGov, Taleo. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think they would certainly, I mean, I guess the simple answer is, in my mind, I'm guilty of thinking there's going to be, there's going to be racism and discrimination in the workplace in most large company hiring scenarios. So certainly I think that there's discrimination that goes on in parallel to companies using those software packages. Uh, I also think there's probably some features in those packages that try to confuse data. Um, I've noticed that they seem to try to make discovery, like a, electronic discovery, with some of those software packages a little more unclear. So that's that's something I can say confidently. <clears throat> Vera, Chuck, and Dave says, in the employer's position statement, which was seven full pages, he says that the employer says he gave me reasonable accommodations. However, they did not. How do I show, explain that in my rebuttal? So anything that shows they didn't, right? You're going to have some kind of written communication, hopefully, text message, email, some kind of form, something where you engage in the reasonable accommodation process and they refuse you. If you don't have that, you got to testify. You got to say, listen, here's my affidavit. Here's what actually happened. He did not accommodate me. Uh, it just never happened. <coughs> Excuse me, this cough, my goodness. Hey, Mario, how are you? Uh, Mario asks us, Hey Vince, when you have a settlement conference in an employment case, what can you ask for? Is this just money settlement? It's not just money. Uh, you can ask for anything you want in settlement. doesn't mean you'll get it. I mean, you can ask for any legal thing. Like you can't ask for, you know, a kilo of ketamine unless you're in a jurisdiction where that's legal. But uh, anything you can legally ask for under the law, you can ask for. So like I've I've had cases settle for, you know, I always joke about it, but I'll never forget a blind cat. Like I had somebody who hired me and she settled her case literally for a blind cat from her job. She wanted the cat. She thought they were going to let the cat die with it. And she, she settled a, a valuable claim. Did the blind cat, right? Like you can get equity. I've, I've had clients get equity. I've had clients get um, stock options. I've had clients get return to work. I've had clients get certain levels of reference of a clients get placement package like the, you you can ask for anything you want okay melanie i'll uh i'll take a look galaxy climber um no news is no news with the eeoc if you are thinking that your case is taking too long, you should know you your attorney can pull the right to sue letter from the EOC if you're working for a private employer and go on to federal court. Like you don't have to just wait for the EOC to keep doing nothing. Nora Pia says, Mr. White is retaliation when management instructs the person you reported for sexual harassment to report you for harassment. If you act scared around them, I would certainly say that I view that as retaliation. Yes, I do view that as retaliatory. Uh, Melanie, I see. Okay, so here's Melanie was working in Canada for a company that was owned by an American company. And Melanie was terminated for blowing the whistle 
So her lawyer sent a demand letter and the American lawyer replied. Um, in-house counsel gets some leeway. So from state to state in the U.S., in-house counsel would have leeway. Like we had Ivan, Ivan Hanel on the channel a while back. And I'm sure Ivan's admitted in a couple of states, but Ivan can also practice as an in-house attorney in many states for that one client, his you know company they works for where he's in-house. I don't know if Ivan could then practice in Canada. I really don't know. Um, it's going to be up to the ethical rules of the jurisdiction where that attorney was probably barred in, most likely, because I don't think that attorney's too worried about the ethical guidelines of Canada. Uh, Canada is not the nation that licensed that attorney, right? So it's it's whatever the rules of the licensing jurisdiction would be for that attorney would be the the uh, controlling rules. <clears throat> Got it. Yeah, Melanie, I don't think he cares. Like if Canada called me up and they're like, hey, we're investigating your your legal practice. I'd be like, well, one, I don't practice in Canada, but two, um, you didn't license me. So ain't nobody got time for you, Canada. And I say that like I'm a Canadian citizen first and I'm a U.S. citizen. I mean, I'm now a dual citizen, but I was originally a Canadian citizen. So I'm not like mocking Canada. I'm just saying nobody cares. Right. Like, um, but by the same token, if Singapore calls me up and they're like, Vince, we think you've committed ethical violations. You're too aggressive in mediation. I'd be like, cool. Good luck with that. Nobody cares. You didn't give me a license. I don't practice. I don't practice law in Singapore. So I don't particularly care what you think about my ethical obligations. Right. Um, so I think contacting that attorney's state in which she or he is licensed is probably more appropriate. Certainly more effective, I think. All right. Are we caught up? Are we caught up? We have a pretty good turnout for New Year's Eve. I'm going to be honest. I was surprised. Uh, I was surprised that people showed up. I'm, I'm glad you're all here. Remember, if you like the uh, if you like the video, it helps us in the algorithm. I'm also surprised nobody's commented on the rubber ducky shirt. Are you guys just that used to me wearing weird outfits that this is normal now? Like, I wear the weird outfits for reactions. And you guys are like, oh, it's just Vince being weird. That's fine. Uh, we have a question here from Cherie Croson. Croson? I assume Croson, maybe. Is there any way I can speed up mediation of my EOC case? I filed on November the 20th. And when the EOC sent the charge to my former employer, I was asked to go to ADR. Cherie, you can ask for earlier mediation. You can say you want mediation by X date or you're not interested. Now, I don't know if they're going to agree to that. But you can tell them what you want. You're in the driver's seat. Dale Nyman says, I'm from SoCal. No outfit is weird. Dale, I respect, I respect that statement. And SoCal is beautiful. I would not want to live in SoCal. But it is beautiful. My friends who live in SoCal love SoCal. Um, eh, let me, let me restate that. All my friends who still live in SoCal, love SoCal, about two thirds of them did actually move to Texas, which was, it's been a weird three years. Uh, DK says my employer's position statement states that I was terminated because they were changing tactics and no longer needed a marketing salesperson, but wanted to focus solely on social media marketing. The next week, a new employee who was... 30 plus years younger, started in this new position. And she is also doing some of the same duties that I previously had done. The proof is on Facebook posts. So DK, I mean, I think you're making the argument that you experienced age discrimination. And the argument they're making is, well, we actually hired somebody with a different skill set. And you're saying, no, you didn't. And one of the arguments you're going to have to make as part of that case is, that her skill set is not different enough from yours. So it sounds like there might be some difference, or there might not. I don't know, but you're gonna have to you're gonna have to make sure they cannot differentiate her skill set from your skill set. So if they're saying, "Oh, we went in a you know a social media direction," 
you're going to want backfill with all the examples of all the social media work that you were doing and all your your extensive resume of social media work, right? You're going to want to make sure they don't get to differentiate her and say, listen, it's not the 30 years of age difference that matters. It's the fact that this new hire was a social media star, right? Um, the sun, the moon, the stars of social media management, right? Like you, you got to prove that that's not what's going on. That's something you're going to want to fight heavily. It's going to become a real decision point, a real um, pitched battle in your case. Galaxy Climber says, so it is definitely a good thing if the EEOC contacts your attorney for more information or clarification about details regarding the case. Um, I mean, listen, it's a good thing in the sense that the EEOC is actually doing something. It's That's positive. I mean, it's it's good that they're getting involved. Um, beyond that, I don't think it means too much. I, I think it's just that the EOC is actually doing something and actually trying to understand your case, which I view as very positive. Nora Pia says, the lawyers I contacted so far have not wanted to take my case. Am I presenting it wrong? Well, Nora, I don't know if you're presenting it wrong. I don't know how you're presenting it. And I don't know who you're contacting. We do have a playlist on how to uh, kind of put like a little shine on your case, fix it up, make it real appealing to attorneys. I would hit that playlist up and see if you can workshop your case a little bit and see if it uh, if you can really melt it down to like an elevator pitch of some kind that will be very appealing and get you lots of offers of representation. Mario Ponce says, by the way, Vince, happy New Year's. I wish you great health. I live in SoCal. Mario, SoCal is beautiful. I'm not making fun of SoCal. I just, it took me back. It took me aback a little bit when two thirds of the human beings who I knew who lived in SoCal were like, we out. That, like, listen, I, I didn't know what to make of it. They're all like, we can't live here anymore. It's not livable. And, and left. And that was, it's like, my goodness. All right. Um, so I, I have less and less reason every day to go to um, SoCal. But again, SoCal is beautiful. Uh, Lindsay Leroux says, uh, re misclassification. Is it a breach of contract if my contract had an independent contractor clause? Do I have to be found misclassified in order to file for a discrimination or harassment case? Oh, I see what you're doing. Okay. So you're worried about the federal laws not always protecting independent contractors. And one of the ways you might argue that you are protected is because you could argue you're misclassified. You were not an independent contractor. Actually, you were an employee. So you should receive federal protections. There's a second path you can play there. In many jurisdictions, eh, in some jurisdictions, independent contractors are protected. One key example, New York City. New York City actually specifically grants the same protections with the New York City Human Rights Law to independent contractors that it does to employees. So there is um, more than one way to skin the cat. And the cat is actually at my door. I closed my door this time because the cat's been so vocal on videos. She's at the door like, let me in, let me in. Made it this far. Thank you. Somebody is asking about the weird outfit. It's my rubber ducky outfit. I thought you would get a laugh out of it. Melanie D says, what are the common negotiation tactics? They offered a low ball amount, which we laughed at and denied. We gave them our counter offer, which they denied and even withdrew their little crumb offer. We still laughed and considered it as a game. Have you seen that tactic often? Yeah, all the time. <clears throat> Melanie, I would say that generally, in my experience, the first offer is positional. It's like signaling uh, where the defendants might ex might hope or might expect the uh, negotiation to go. So like, I don't know what the offer was, obviously, but if somebody came and offered, I don't know, 20 grand, often I would hear, tell my client, like, listen, okay, if we started at 200 grand and they started at 20 grand, there's a decent chance they think we're going to end up between 80 and 120, right? Um, I don't know for a fact that's what they thought. I don't know what they offered you, but that's a possibility. Let's see. We have more questions. Oh, 1500 They offered 1500 Melanie? I mean, that's not even nuisance value. Like, nuisance value in this field is going to be like 
five to 15, sometimes as high as 20. So they were under nuisance value. <clears throat> they were telling you they thought your case had no merit, I think. Or they were treating you like a jerk. Uh, Lindsay LaRoe, I can't tell you the state laws of Colorado. I'm not allowed to. I can tell you the federal laws that pen through the EOC and the federal courts in Colorado, but I'm not allowed to tell you the state laws of Colorado. I'm sorry, you're going to have to check with local counsel, um, but it would be worth your time to check with local counsel to find out if the local or state laws of Colorado protect independent contractors. And remember to check both state and local, which are not the same, right? The state laws of Colorado might help you, they might not, but like the local laws of Denver might help you, right? There's like, there's, there's going to be like different laws in different places. So check those as well. <clears throat> DK says, Vince, thank you for your answer. I have a certificate in social media marketing, but my employer never asked if I had any experience because it was not part of my original job duties. Okay. I mean, listen, that's going to be something you're going to argue, but they're going to say, well, we didn't know. And we didn't know might be a fairly good defense because if they didn't know, maybe they just thought they had to hire somebody differently. Um, that might be a defense to age discrimination, but you might also be able to defeat that. Uh, Betty Lynn says, one of the, in one of the performance improvement plans, my supervisor wrote, uh, he said that he will ask colleagues their opinions about me. Is this within the scope of a performance improvement plan? Could be. Yeah. I mean, listen, it's performance improvement plans are the wild west. They, they can have whatever metrics they want. And if the company thinks you're having a tough time working with your coworkers, it could certainly solicit feedback from you uh, about you from your coworkers. That's certainly entirely legal. <clears throat> Excuse me. Corey says, hi, I'm Robert. Like you and a few, uh, Oh, you, I like your videos. A few uh, questions for you. If I have a case for defamation, doesn't matter how long or small, how big or small it is, or as long as I got a case, I got a case. <clears throat> Corey, it absolutely matters how big or small it is. Um, most defamation cases, clients pay for on an hourly basis, but not all. Like if you have a really, really big, really high value, really provable defamation case, it is possible that you will be one of those rare, super rare defamation cases that you can get an attorney to handle on a contingency basis, right? Like to take, like they might be able to like bankroll your case and take a percentage of what they win for you. 99 times out of 100 defamation cases are dog shit. And attorneys are going to be, bad attorneys will be like, oh yeah, pay me hourly to take this. And good attorneys will be like, you should not hire me to take this. Um, and sometimes... Cases will be good, but just not high enough value or just very high risk. And I'll say things like, listen, uh, this is not a good risk for my firm. Like, we're not going to spend 60 grand on your case uh, because we think it's high risk. But like, if you want to spend 60 grand on it, knowing that we think it's super high risk, like you could potentially do that. But um, the point here is like the value of the claim and how risky it is matters because you might be able to obtain representation on your terms in whatever system or whatever arrangement you prefer. And also, like, bringing a defamation case that's got no value, like, it's a waste of time. Who cares, right? For you, I mean. <clears throat> Dale Diamond says, in a two-defendant case, if one sues the other to determine liability before initial discovery, in your opinion, does that imply much about the strength of the initial case? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it means that at least one of your defendants took the time to spend legal fees and effort because they think there's actual liability in your case, right? So that's that's positive. That's a po At least one of your defendants is worried about your case. So good for you. Uh, our small brown dog, are plaintiffs represented by counsel allowed to ask deponents questions and follow up questions directly during a deposition? Uh, no. And Everything you're saying makes me very concerned for your attorney-client relationship, and um, you, you're giving me the you're giving me a case of the worries about what's going on in your case. That if you don't trust your attorney to, to conduct a deposition such that you think you're going to do a better job, then why do you have an attorney? 
I will not let the cat in. I will not let the cat in. The cat has a loud mouth, and the cat will not be let in. Uh, Indy on a Jones. I'm sorry. Let me know if the audio cutting gets worse. Let me know. Okay, Robert Stalhersky says, okay, I lied. One more question. Is the total damage amount sought typically higher at federal court versus state court, or is there no difference? Robert, it changes from state to state because your state and local laws change from state to state. So in most jurisdictions, uh, in most jurisdictions, our firm would choose to bring a case in federal court for a variety of reasons. But that video I released a couple days ago about, you know, choosing to be in federal or state court, it kind of underlines that like, as the laws change, as the jury pools change uh, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, you might in certain situations choose state court and you might seek higher damages because of a change in law or change in the case law, or change in the venue, change in the judge, change in the jury pool. There's a lot of things that can happen that might change your demand in different courts. Uh, choosing federal versus state is always a detailed driven uh, question. And that video that I put out a couple of days ago, I don't know if that video was for you or for somebody else, but um, it was a discussion, I think it was like a 20 minute discussion of some of the things we think about when you're choosing between federal and state court. Uh, Chris Valentine says, Chris Valentine, I respect the mustache. I can only see a little tiny avatar, but it, it looks like a very good mustache. So if I was wearing a hat, I would take it off to you. Chris Valentine says, Vince, how do I put together a rebuttal without copious notes diverting and defending myself with their lies? I want to give a sharp, possibly salty rebuttal. Chris, I put all of my my core of my being into a rebuttals 101 video that I created like six months ago. That is, if you're if you're doing a pro se rebuttal, you're representing yourself and you're doing a rebuttal, that is my final word on rebuttals. Um I sent it out to a gentleman today. Somebody emailed me like trying to get like our internal firm rebuttal structure. And I was like, I made you this video. This video is going to help you. And I hope that video helps you as well. Like that's how I think a pro se litigant should structure a rebuttal. I think it is the best path for a pro se litigant to reduce risk and add value. Um, do I think that better rebuttals could be created? and means not using that video, like other other tactics, I do. I absolutely do. But I think in general, for pro se litigants, this is the simplest and most effective means to reduce risk and add value to your case in a rebuttal. Um, but obviously, listen, if you have counsel, you know, you're going to have a team, you're going to spend a lot more time, you're going to have a lot of experience at your disposal, it, it could be better. Uh, Gauss Climber, what are the other levels besides nuisance level cases? I would say, um, you, I mean, there's nothing like formalized. There's nuisance value cases, but there's also, you know, solid cases. Uh, solid cases to me are anything 40,000 and up. I mean, those are claims that are worth money, that are potentially worth pursuing. Um, and then, you know, you have. You, once you get into the six figures, you have <coughs> low six figures, high six figures, and you have um, buy yourself a farm. Just the seven figure, the seven figure cases, right? Um, T E J says, "Is it true if a company has to pay out a settlement, someone in the company will be fired, like the person who caused the liability to the company?" Often, yeah. Often, the person who caused the liability will, will be fired, but not always. Supervisor lied in an email and got me fired. Does that matter? Corey, it matters if the lie or the termination were motivated by some form of discrimination or sexual harassment or retaliation. If you were an at-will employee, don't assume you were an at-will employee, but if you were an at-will employee and that's what happened and it was just a supervisor being shady, it might not be a claim, but always check with local counsel, different laws, different jurisdictions. Made it this far. This is not a costume. I am wearing this to my New Year's Eve festivities tonight. This is how I dress in my finest finery. Abby. Uh, Cherie Croissant says, uh, my former employer tried to get me to sign a blood oath. 
my severance? Can I add that to my damages? I don't. I mean, was it actually a blood oath? If they were like, if you let us cut you open for the severance package, then yes, I think you might include that in damages. If what you're actually saying is they tried to get me to sign a severance package and as part of that severance they wanted releases and confidentiality and some non-disparagement clauses and all the the normal stuff then no that's not a damage that's someone offering you a, a severance package and you saying no thank you you can be mad as mad as you want about it and i think you might be right to be mad but you probably it's probably not a source of damages for your case henry best believe says if one person that accused me and another made a decision in my termination I've switched locations. Does that hurt or help my case? One moved out of the country, the other moved across the country. <clears throat> Both still work for the company, and the audio is good here on my end. So the one who's out of the country might be difficult to produce as a witness, and that might be in your favor. The one who's on the other side of the country, probably not that hard. Uh, also, there's a decent chance that lots that many courts will let them appear telephonically. So don't um don't count them out yet. All right. Let's scroll. Whoa. Whoa. I hit the scroll button and jumped. Jumped a whole bunch. Uh, Ivan Rivera says, after opposing discrimination, my general manager put me on an administrative leave and wrote me a letter saying that he regarded me as having a mental health condition and being a direct threat. My goodness. He lied about my essential job duties and lied about me working with knives and box cutters to my doctor in order to coerce me into having a mental fitness for duty. Do you think I have a case? Yeah. Sounds like you might have a case. Sounds like you might have a perceived uh, mental disability, perceived mental health, perceived disability claim, essentially, under the federal laws and potentially under state and local law as well. I've been, I would talk to local attorneys about that. No question. Pam Maroon says, please stand up and show us your ducky setup. I will not. The uh, standing up is for my OnlyFans only. But thank you for your inquiry. Uh, oh, oh, chat is jumping again. Oh, good, Robert. I'm glad you saw that video about the uh, choosing federal court versus state court. Uh, Ivan goes on to say, I passed the mental fitness for duty, but this reputation led me to getting fired later uh, on with no evidence, just that I'm a threat and perception is reality. Yeah, Ivan, I think that you have a perceived disability claim. Oh, Wizzy the Gamer said, okay, R Wizzy, I'm going to read what you said and then I'll say what I thought. Wizzy the Gamer says, hey, buddy, I recently said in a video post, how are your questions so relevant to me? Meaning that I'm shocked how relevant your answers are to me. I wasn't saying you weren't relevant. Sorry for the confusion. Not a, I read I read your response quick, and I was like, I mean, it's not relevant. Then it wasn't for you. <laughs> like, and I'm sorry. Like, my response was kind of like, listen, man, I'm sorry I didn't help, but like, uh, I think it's, I think I've directly answered like multiple questions for you. So like, this is this is a weird swing, like. <laughs> It was, was my was my only response that I was like, I don't get it, man. What's going on? <laughs> Sorry, I tried to help. Like, but I, thank you for saying that. That actually makes me feel a lot better because I just responded to that and I was like, okay, well, sorry that your free help wasn't what you wanted. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you for saying that. Um Mario Ponce says, Vincent, if I am not disputing termination because I know I was wrong. <sighs> Can they use this against me, my other causes of action for failure to accommodate and failure to engage in the indirect process? Mario, you're going to have discrete claims. Like the termination claim is going to be one part of it, and it's going to be the lion's share potentially of your damages, but it doesn't mean that your other claims are extinguished. The other claims still could be one and still have their own value. Uh. Mall Brown Dog, at what point is it too late to dismiss your claims in state court, switch counsel and file in federal court? Um, I mean, the easiest way to answer that question is, did you file an EOC charge within 300 days or 180 days, depending on which state you're in? 
of the discrimination you experience. And if you did, do you have a right to sue letter or can you obtain one? If you can get a timely right to sue letter or if you already have one that is still timely, it's not run out, it's 90 day window, then you can still technically file your case in federal court. Now there's two further questions, small brown dog. One, will the state court release your claim? And odds are most state courts will because your claim is work and courts generally don't like doing work. Additionally speaking, if you want to switch attorneys, uh, that can be sticky because if you're in a contingent relationship with your attorney, if your attorney has a percentage of your case, then dismissing your attorney, the attorney may have a lien against your case and then you're going to have to like negotiate that lien and you're going to have to hire another attorney. It can be hard to hire another attorney. Well, there's a, there's a prior lien against your case. It can be a little difficult. Uh, Sage Page says, I am back at work and boys, the department talking. How can I protect myself at work while I am in the middle of a lawsuit? Document, document, document. Remember, anyone who gives you so much as a stink eye or says something mean about you, that could be retaliation. If you're, listen, I don't know what your lawsuit's about, but if your lawsuit's about workplace discrimination, workplace sexual harassment, then you are in the prime zone. You're in the pocket. You're Eli Manning playing for the Giants with a Swiss cheese line, and you were going to take hits, and then you were going to file retaliation claims, okay? Um, oh, Wizzy, don't worry about it. I don't actually have feelings. I don't even have the capacity for most human emotion. I appreciate you. So Wizzy says, I feel, I seriously feel so bad. You may have thought I was talking about you not being helpful. It's the opposite. Uh, Wizzy, don't sweat it. Like, I don't have a full set of human emotions. I literally saw that. I was like, I, okay, <laughs> sorry. And that was the end of it. Like I did, I wasn't salty. I, I, I sincerely, what I said was sincere. I was like, sorry, it wasn't helpful. I'm like, we're good. Don't worry at all. Wizzy goes on. Ha 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 ha. Glad I could explain. Love you, man. Yeah, it's mutual. No worries at all. No worries at all. <sighs> okay, Melanie, I'm really glad I helped. Uh, Kristen says, have you found that return to office policies are negatively impacting people with disabilities? Yes. Although it obviously depends on the disability. Um, the return to office litigation has been insane. Um, and there's, and it's, it's so different now because companies used to say, we don't do remote work. That's not reasonable for us. Spent the last three years proving it was reasonable. They did it right. So now when somebody with um, an immune condition says, hey, I can't go to the office because I can't, uh, the vaccine doesn't work for me uh, and I can't, I just, this video just got demonetized because I said the V word, YouTube. <laughs> I know who cares about the money, but it's just weird because they're, they're going to restrict the video now. Um, <sighs> there's like a little AI sensor, like we got to cut, cut, cut them out now. Um, so somebody with immune condition says, I, I, I can't go to work. And the employer says, oh, that makes sense. And then somebody would say an anxiety condition or depression condition or IBS or like any number of other disabilities says, well, I also can't go to work. The employer is in a much harder place to say, well, we don't care about your thing because it's mental health because the law doesn't differentiate, right? Like a mental health disability is as real under the law as a physical disability. Um now, listen, are there, are there some differences between like, I'm suffering and I could die? Yeah, sure. I mean, there, there are differences. I'm not saying that, I'm not saying, you know, one to one, but I am saying um, people with disabilities have a lot more leverage now, but also, I mean, listen, I'm not a mental health professional, but it seems like a lot of people had their disabilities uh, exacerbated a great deal. And a lot of damage was done. A lot of suffering was caused by the isolation and stuff like that. And, and people are having a, a really hard time with certain disabilities going back to the office. So yeah, I think return to office is hurting a lot of people and creating a lot of litigation. Let me take a Tums while I read the next question from Lindsay Leroux.
Lindsay, I'm sorry. I don't know what you're saying. Let me, let me try to talk it through. Let me see if I understand. Does the termination clause of a contract supersede independent contractor law? Well, so you're asking about, I think you're asking about Colorado law again, and I'm not allowed to answer questions about Colorado law. Speaking in generalities, what you're saying is probably not accurate. Like, there's a lot of independent contractor contracts across the nation with a lot of termination conditions written into them. So while a given state might have a default set of laws that say, oh, you would need a breach to terminate, that default set may often, and I'm not speaking to Colorado law because I'm not neither allowed nor am I knowledgeable on Colorado contractual law, but it's very, very likely that where the contract deals with something, the default law may not then control. So just be aware of that and talk with local counsel. Whoa, channel just jumped ahead. Uh, whoa. Okay. Uh, Indy Anna Jones says, if the owner of the establishment I work for told management to cut the hours of those people, whoa, whoa, we got on those people. And the only people who were affected were African Americans. Is that a case for discrimination? I mean, yeah. So at any point where you where you have a you people tied to a negative workplace consequence, go ahead and file that. I mean, I'll, listen, go ahead and check that local council. I can't tell you what to file, not file, but like, I mean, even white people who live in places where they've never seen a black person know what you people means. You know, I mean, like literally populations in Tibet who have never in their life interacted with an African-American or an African for that matter, or anyone who wasn't Tibetan perhaps would, would know what you people means, right? Like, I think, I think we all know what you people means or those people, those people. Um, God, people are so fucking shitty. Ah, all right. Uh, Sherry Croissant says, I was fired after reporting my boss made a derogatory remark to a room of only African-American staff. After I reported it to HR, he egregiously wrote me up and I was fired in less than 30 days. Retaliation claim. Talk to an attorney. Bring that case. Retaliation claims are generally lower risk and higher value for a variety of reasons. We have a whole bunch of videos on why and how on the channel. But yes, retaliation claim. Retaliate like, ah, burden shifting. Evidence in your favor. File that. Talk to attorneys. Talk to local counsel. Oh, I just saw Shuri has audio and emails as proof. Yeah. Talk to attorneys. Get, that case is worth bringing. That case is worth bringing. Certainly, I believe so. Based on what I know now, understanding that I don't know the fullness of the situation, I would say certainly that case is worth bringing to attorneys and looking at whether or not you want to file it. I would expect you'll receive an offer from every firm you speak to. Corey says, I got fired on 12 6 23 for maybe being a whistleblower. <coughs> I reported three different times. I know racism is going on. I told the ops manager all three times, and it was documented all three times. Will I get some money? I think you would. If you file a claim, I mean, so you engage to protect the activity. Careful saying whistleblower, because whistleblower claims are much higher risk. What you actually have is a retaliation claim, believe it or not, because you, you engage to protect the activity. You oppose discrimination. And on a federal level, opposing discrimination is a way more powerful claim than blowing the whistle. You engage in protected activity, you oppose discrimination, and now you've experienced a terrible negative workplace consequence. You were terminated. And the best way to think of this is that because of the burden shifting with retaliation claims, your employer will be viewed potentially as guilty until proven innocent of that act of retaliation. Now, you gotta get your hands in that documentation of the three times you engage in protected activity. But let me tell you, that is potentially one hell of a claim. 
Uh, Ray Bethel says, uh, when the, whoa, oh, heaven sent. That's very kind of you to send me money. Very sweet of you. And I appreciate it so much. Don't send me money, but thank you so much again. Um, uh, if you really feel the need to send me money, only send me $2. Apparently that's people tell me that's the minimum amount that like helps the channel with the algorithm. Um, but it's very sweet of you. Thank you so much. I will heart your, your money, but, um, I'm in a very fortunate place in my life where, uh, I don't particularly need more money. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you again very much. I just, I would rather you have the money and you use it to fight your case. Oh, I now see why you sent money. Do you have a question, Fendi? Okay. Uh, I will get to that question. I don't want to lose questions here. Uh, Ray Beth. Uh, okay. Let me, let me answer heaven sense questions. Um, can you get, so heaven sent said, can you get punitive and emotional damages and national labor relations board judgments? Um, in certain situations you can absolutely get punitive, but I'm not sure about emotional damages off the top of my head. I actually assume maybe not based on my recollection of some of the NLRB rulings that I've read. Um, but I'd have to check for you and I'm happy to do that. Certainly uh, when I'm not live at some point, if you want to comment this question on a video, I will try to create you an answer that will go live on uh, the next like seven days. If you get this up in the next 48 hours. Uh, I will pull the damages specifically, but when you comment your question on a video, tell me what the claim is for specifically, because that's going to help me give you a more complete answer. Okay. Uh, and oh, last thing I'll say with the NLRB is remember the NLRB can force settle your case, which sounds insane, but is a fact. They can just contact you and be like, hey, congratulations, your case is settled. You're like, what? I didn't settle my case. But no, we did. I did. I'm the investigator in your case. I, I chose to settle your case. You're like, but I didn't want to settle my case. I'm like, well, I settled it for 20 grand. I didn't agree to that, well, but you don't have to. I did. That's a scary thing that the NLRB can and often does do. So just be aware of that. All right, let me go back here. Um, when So Ray Bethel says, when the company fires you and realize they violated the law, do you have to accept the job back knowing you're in a right to work state? Does not accepting the job hurt your case? Uh, Ray, it hurts your damages. So to whatever extent you had economic damages, when they offer you the job back and you refuse it, they can make an argument that your economic damages stop growing. Now, you can argue that you still have emotional damages and potentially punitive damages and some amount of economic damage that accrued before they offered you the job back. You can also argue that your economic damage should still be growing because you don't want that job back because those are shitty people and you don't want to work for them. But them offering the job back does give them a fairly solid argument that you're going to have to wrestle with and which they might might be successful with, which is, again, your economic damages can't keep growing. We tried to bring you back. We tried to mitigate this. We tried to make this right. Uh, Robert Stahlhersky says, I read that you'll be taxed on almost all of a received settlement. Uh, that is not true. You will be taxed on your settlement. You will not be taxed to the tune of the entirety of the settlement. Um, is this also true for judgment achieved through trial? So you live, I presume, in the United States, and I don't know what state you live in, but any employment settlement or verdict, Uncle Sam and the lovely state you live in, if they have taxes, they're going to take their piece. Now, they won't take a piece of whatever your attorney gets paid, generally speaking, if the settlement is structured correctly. And it helps a whole bunch, right? Because your attorney is going to get a, a, potentially a percentage. And um, you're not going to have to pay tax on that percentage that the attorney gets. And that's very helpful. But, you know, yeah, you're going to be taxed uh, no matter what. And I will say in settlement, at least you can structure the settlement to be best practices for you with your tax professional before you agree to the settlement. Um but last note there, the IRS 
keeps a very avid eye out for these settlements. They actually hunt these settlements because people used to structure these settlements in ways that were a little too aggressive for the tax treatment. So the IRS uh, eyeballs an awful lot of these settlements in this field. Uh, Sherry says, how do I proceed in mediation? Aggressively. Sounds like you have a hell of a claim. So like Sherry's got some pretty solid retaliation claims, a lot of proof. Yeah, I, I would say, listen, calculate your damages. If you have counsel, have a conversation about what they think you should demand and then go with what you feel is right for you. Um, but you, you have a, you have a real strong foundation of your claim. Like you're, you're in a good place. Um, excuse me. I would not, uh, I would not be a pushover at mediation. Certainly. Okay. What do we have? What do we have? Okay, small brown dog, I see your notes there. I don't know if it changes my answer necessarily. Uh, Henry Best Believe says, I got suspended. She then talked to coworkers and influenced the investigation. HR managers never asked for a statement from me or from my witnesses. My witness was a manager. Told my manager, they told my manager specifically to stay out of it. Do I have something? Also, after I was suspended, said they need, said I needed to go on leave. When this was cleared up, they brought me back with a bogus pretext and fired me. So, Henry, um, it's possible that you have a client. Like, I, why did they take her word over yours? Why didn't they get your side of the story? Why wouldn't they talk to your witnesses? Right? If you think that some form of discrimination motivated a biased investigation, then you may have a claim. Certainly. <clears throat> Oh, Wizard the Gamer says, oh, and in that last comment of mine on your video, I wasn't talking about your intake specialist. The local intake specialist had told me <coughs> they only accept termination cases. Very discouraging. Wizzy, I knew you weren't talking about mine because I spent a lot of time listening to those recordings with our intake specialist. Like we we do not, an intake specialist was like, ah, you got to be fired. We don't care. Would not be here. That would not. That would not be acceptable to me, and I don't feel that way about cases at all. Henry, I actually think I have done videos on unfair investigations motivated by discrimination before. I think it might have been a couple of years ago, or at least like a year ago. So, like, it might be hard to find because there's, I don't know, there's a couple thousand videos now, I think. But um, I'm not going to do a fresh video on that because. It doesn't come up that often, but like the original video on that was, I think, pretty good. I think I spent some time. So, you know, check it out. See if it helps you out. And if you have follow-up questions, I'm certainly happy to help. Uh, what do we got? What do we have? Cristobal Arroyo says, at a safety committee meeting, I reported safety concerns and unsafe working conditions. When I got out of the meeting, my supervisor pushed me to start production when we were not ready. I explained this to him, and he abruptly yelled at me. I went to HR to report this behavior. Two, two days later, I got fired. I would file your case with OSHA. That sounds like a very clear cut OSHA claim. There might be additional state law claims wherever you are. Certainly um, could be. Uh Indiana Jones, listen, if you have witnesses, get, get their affidavits locked down now. Ivan Rivera says, I was fired mostly due to my general manager, his boss, the vice president and corporate discriminating and harassing me several times on paper. Every time I oppose discrimination, I can prove it was the VP who was behind it. All do you think it helps or hurts me that the VP retired a couple of weeks after they can the company received my charge of discrimination from the EOC? I think it helps you. They, that, that VP might not be available to oppose your claim. Thomas A says, if you're getting harassed, it's your fault. Thomas, you sound like an incel. Um, I'm not saying you are. I don't know you. Just saying that post was a little, little incel y. Uh, small brown dog, if a physician employment contract has 90 day notice provision, but no pay in lieu of notice or garden leave clause, can they pay you in lieu of notice if it hurts your patients or reputation? Um, I mean, if you agree to it in a contract, 
odds are a court would say, well, you agreed to it. And why would you agree to it if you didn't want that term? You might be able to argue to a court in some jurisdiction that that's unduly burdensome or unfair to you. I can't speak to what a court might find. Uh, but if I kind of, as you're explaining it, it sounds like you made a deal and you don't like it anymore, um, which might not have the most traction. Happy New Year, Lindsay LaRoe. Uh, Gigi says, my lawyer sent a demand letter. We are past due 90 days. She gave them 30 in that letter. I try to talk to her. What's going on? She's always busy. I have feeling something very shady is going on. Gigi, I would not assume something shady is going on. I would assume something lazy is going on. Um, this, this happens a lot in this field. So there's a lot of attorneys in this field who are overwhelmed, who take on too many cases because they get excited about lots of cases and they want to make lots of money. And then they take on more cases and they actually have the staff or the ability to work properly. And they get overwhelmed and sometimes they get big bad settlements and they take a couple of weeks off and they don't want to. So, so like I would, I would, do I know the attorney's not shady? No, there's a lot of shady attorneys. Well, I'm not saying your attorney's not shady. I'm just saying, don't jump to the idea that your attorney's shady when there are simpler answers like Occam's razor. The simplest answer is probably the right one where there's a decent chance your attorney is just overworked, lazy, incompetent. Like there's, there's much simpler answers than shadiness. Lakers and five, can you get punitive damages from EOC mediation? Uh, so the true answer is yes, you can get any form of damages you negotiate for from a settlement. And you're free to negotiate for punitive damages if you want to. Important additional information, Lakers and five, most employers are not going to negotiate punitive damages at a mediation. Most employers... Um, Most employers won't. Thomas A., that's actually a good post. Thomas A. says, find your lawyers off the bar database, not cartoon-looking ads. Don't Google. I generally agree with you. The Bar Association is a great option. I also have a video about using avo.com, which is another kind of database that's tied to many Bar Association databases. That's also a really good way of finding an attorney. Thomas, I'm sorry I called you an incel. That's good advice. I think you're, I think you're giving good, good advice here. Um, I have a video on the channel about finding local, actually I have a whole playlist on the channel about finding local employment counsel. And Thomas, you were actually mirroring some of the things I say in that, in that playlist. So thank you, Thomas. I take everything unfortunate I said about you back. Uh, Mario Pont says, fighting state government entities is a pain because of tax money. Yeah, I mean, you're going to get taxed no matter who you're suing. But yeah, they do have a deep war chest because of tax money. That's certainly true. Uh, DK says my former company did not have an employee manual at the time that I was terminated. They have since put out a manual. Does this matter in my case? Not at all. Employee manuals are not that meaningful. Heaven sent if the national labor relations board force settles your NLRB case, it will not impact your EEOC case unless you make the mistake of signing a global settlement, which settles all of your claims. Just make sure that you don't sign a global settlement that settles all of your claims elsewhere. Uh, Corey, you should tell you should be up front with your lawyer. You should be up front with your lawyer. So Corey says, when I choose a lawyer, should I tell him or her that I want to take it to court so I can get punitive damages? Quick answer is you should be up front with your lawyer and honest. So yes. Second answer is a lot of attorneys won't take your case, right? Like if you're like, I want to like... If the attorney's like, I think your case is worth 600 grand. And you're like, yeah, but if we get punies, punitive damages, we might get 30 mil. And the attorney's like, well, okay, but I got you 600 grand as a settlement offer. And you're like, I don't want 600 grand. I want to fight for 30 mil because I think I'm going to get punitive damages. Like a lot of attorneys are going to think you're an asshole and a crazy person and that you're not understanding the risk of trial and that you're wasting a lot of time and effort and money and, and you're trying to throw away 600 grand that they got you. So like, be aware there's a tension there, right? A lot of attorneys are not going to be like super pumped about you refusing really good settlements um, because you think you might win more punitives at trial. So just, just be aware of that as you're being upfront with your attorneys. <clears throat> Wizzy, I do actually, um, I've been reading the, uh, the Dark Tower series. So, so Wizzy just mentioned that the room looks cozy. Yeah, I love this room. I mean, this whole farm is like a, a, a lot of work to fix this place up. But like, I love this room. Big fan of this room. 
Um, and over time, it's coming together. We got our uh, NYC job attorney sign. We got our little chicken in Times Square artwork. It's coming along. It's, you know, it's getting nice. I think it's getting nice. Um, what we have here, what do we have here? What do we have? Uh, oh, made it this far. Oh, Gigi, that is very kind of you. You did not have to send me money. I, I don't know how to like your post, but thank you. It was very, very kind of you. Uh, I just have to repeat, everyone. You don't need to send me money. <laughs> uh, but thank you very much. Uh, made it this far says, if the employer is trying to run out the 90 day clock for me to file a federal claim, should my attorney stop waiting and file the federal case? Yes. Or, I mean, you could execute a tolling agreement, uh, which is like a contractual agreement to let that case be filed later. But yeah, I would just file. Like, why Why would you let a 90-day statute of limitations with the right to sue letter run out? Like, file, in my, in my opinion. Happy New Year to you as well, Henry Best Believe. Oh, Sage Page says, women are coming me, coming to me to share their pregnancy discrimination stories. Should I remain silent on the details of my case and retain the information for evidence if needed in court? Um, that's up to you. That's more of a moral question in a lot of ways. I mean, listen, sharing details of your case can let the employer ultimately find out about your case. Like there's a lot of there's a lot of situations where somebody will out you about your case if you share details about your case. Um, but you're kind of, it's a question of like, do you want to talk to these people? Do you want to corroborate with these people? Do you want to collaborate with these people? You, you know, there's a lot you can do with, with co-defendants that might be positive. Uh, David Leo Campo says over a year work failed to accommodate me on a religious accommodation tied to the mandates. Is there a delay of accommodation? Looks like the mandate not going well. Yeah, so the mandate is not going well, and you're you're. I mean, you're correct with that. Like most mandates are being dropped, but um, unless you're from one of the very few religious sects that have a long and tried and true history of not accepting medical care, such as the medical care that was mandated here, um, your claim is probably not very good. So most of those claims are thrown out. There's a lot of really negative case law on the mandates. And the fact that the mandates were stupid isn't going to help your case, believe it or not, which sounds insane. I know that sounds insane. And you're you're probably getting mad at me right now for saying what I'm saying. But like, unless you, listen, if you're a Christian scientist, actually, I don't even know if Christian scientists can anymore. There's like two faiths right now that I can remember off the top of my head that are like really successful at getting the religious accommodation to beat the mandate. And then there's just a whole bunch of people running around who say like, well, I personally believe, and that's not necessarily going to fall. Like, it's still a religious accommodation, but it's a religious accommodation based on personal belief, not the rulings of a governing body of a religion. And courts and agencies do tend to treat those two things very differently. Um, if you can prove in the writings of your faith or the ruling body of your faith that they have a hardline rule about, accepting a certain kind of medical care, then um, <laughs> then somebody just wrote punies and it was very funny. Um, if you if you can uh, prove uh, a long time rule in your faith, then you have a very strong religious accommodation case. If you on the other hand are like, well, my faith doesn't believe this, but I do, or I'm a faith of one and I personally believe this, those cases have not gone well. I'm sorry, David uh, Leo Campos. I hope I hope that's at least informative. I don't mean to belittle your claim. And listen, I wish you success. I'm not saying I don't. I'm not saying I don't wish you success. Those laws were stupid. No question. <clears throat> Ivan Rivera says, my charge of discrimination was officially filed in mid-May of 2023. I have not received the company's position statement as of yet, and it's about to be eight months. I agreed to mediation, but have not heard a response from the company. It is still under investigation in the portal. I have not been assigned an investigator yet. Is it good or bad in your opinion? I want to rebuttal already. 
Um, yeah, it's not good or bad. I mean, it's bad in that they're keeping you waiting. But it's not bad as in, like, they don't believe in your case or something like that. It's just it's the EOC is overstaffed and the people it is staffed with generally don't care about you. I mean, they're government employees. Government employees generally don't care, right? Um, it is it just kind of they are who they are. They, it is what it is. And, that, you know, not all EOC employees are created equal. Some are amazing, right? I just need to address the person who wrote punies as in, like, laser, pew, pew, knees. That made me chuckle really hard. Um, I just, I can imagine like a client just at a mediation. I actually, I can imagine myself at a mediation. Somebody's like, you'll never win punitive damages. You'll never win punies. And I'm like, pew, pew. I think I will. Like, I just, that makes me chuckle really hard. Uh, Corey, I don't know if you're telling me that I'm cool as hell, but I'm going to assume you are. Cause I think I am. No, I'm kidding. I don't, I hate myself, but thank you. If that was, if you're referring to me. Sage Page, happy to help. I hope I helped in some way. Um, Betty Lynn says, my current attorney said cannot continue and introduced another attorney who is contingency based and can do court, but asked me to pay all costs at like court, jury, copy, fax, is paying all costs normal. Uh, yeah, it, it's common, Betty Lynn. I mean, um, I, I'll say that like clients at our firm generally are not paying costs like there's 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 firms that ask you to pay costs. There's firms that front costs for you. There's firms that cover costs for you. Uh, there's just different arrangements, and you should reach a deal with whatever works for you. <clears throat> Sean S says I claim discrimination. The HR director no longer works there. Do I have a case? I don't know. I don't know enough to tell you if you have a case or not. Did they do something bad to you? If they did something bad to you. Um, and that's why you complained of discrimination, or if they did something to you that was bad because you complained of discrimination, either one of those would be a claim. Oh, YouTube is telling me that it's playing ads right now. I don't know how many of you are seeing ads. Uh, Chuck P801 says, how should I play my hand with three hours of audio of upper management and a GM saying they are going to let me go because of my disability? Okay, so aggressively. You should play your hand aggressively, I would say. Am I caught up? Is that the last question? Did I actually answer all the questions on, on New Year's Eve? If we're out of questions, I'm going to go live my life. I am the, Richard, I am the second best employment lawyer on YouTube. We know there's one bigger. Richard, it's always good to see you. I feel like you've been uh, on the channel for so long now. I feel like uh, I have a parasocial relationship with you. That when you don't actually know somebody, but you feel like you do. Uh, Martin Sant uh, Santelises says, "I have a failure to hire case. They discriminated against me uh, in a text message saying they didn't want to hire me because the lawyer wants African Americans only. Is this worth it?" I mean, yeah, it sounds worth it. Listen, I if you're not African American and if you're in possession of a text that says we're not going to hire you because you're not African American, that's a case. That has value. I would I would talk to local attorneys, consider filing that. That sounds like it has a value. Um I mean, listen, I don't know anything else about the case, but based on what you're sharing with me, that sure as hell sounds like a claim. And if at any point somebody's writing to you, that your race is the reason you're not getting a job, that is a claim. That's we can go ahead and I can I can uh, support that shorthand pretty pretty strenuously. All right, I think we ran out of questions today. So an hour and ten minutes in, usually we go an hour and a half before we run out of questions. Actually, I don't think we ever run out of questions before. Um, oh, one last question. Okay, Melanie D says I am planning on playing it aggressively given. The employer is asking me to retract my whistleblowing reports. Would that be a good strategy in your opinion? Melanie, I don't I don't think I know enough about your case or the laws where you are. I can't. I think you're pursuing a case on the laws of Canada. And I don't know the laws of Canada, nor am I allowed to speak to the laws of Canada. I am not a, a barrister. Is that is that what you have up there? Um, 
so my thoughts would be of lesser value about a claim in Canada. But generally speaking, if you have a strong claim and you know it and you can prove it, I would urge you to be aggressive, certainly. Okay, everyone, we are an hour and 15 minutes in. It was lovely. I hope you're all having a great holiday. Um, I'm going to sign off and uh, I will see you all in 2024. And I hope that your employment woes end and you don't need me anymore. And I never hear from you again. Not because I don't want to talk to you. Because I don't want you to need an employment attorney. It sucks to need an employment attorney. It's never good. It's never good when you have to talk to me. Um, trust me, my friends. My friends will let you know. It's never good when you have to talk to me. Ooh, Michelle Tarleton, I'm really glad to hear about the New Year's Eve gumbo. And uh, I hope it's helpful. And I hope that you are well. Everyone, have a great holiday. And uh, signing off. Uh, remember, if you can, like the stream. It helps the channel grow. Bye. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you for saying that. Happy New Year.